Jerry Fabris, museum curator, and I work、uh, mostly with the sound recordings and the phonograph and phonographs in the collection. I've gotten into that gradually.、Um, uh, I learned initially from a collector who lives out on Long Island. Besides the Chronos behind you, what's the most interesting recording project you've done? Or tell me about a couple of them. Well, the first one we did in this room in modern times was、uh, with the Wynton Marsalis Septet. Oh wow! And that was really that was really、uh, a fun one. Uh -huh. um, uh, another one we did、uh, following that one was in 1994. We invited Les Paul,、right. who lives not too far in Mawa, New Jersey,、sure. and he came,、uh, played electric guitar,、mm -hmm. but he just had a total blast. He loved it, and、uh, he actually、uh, it was it was a public it was a program for the public,、right. but he came a month before and just wanted to do it as a test、right. and and tried a bunch of different horns and. Spent almost a whole day just making test recordings. <laughs>、mm -hmm. When was this room in use, making wax recordings? Oh, okay.、Um, this room, the laboratory was built、um, not too long after Edison completed his work with the light bulb.、Mm -hmm. um, he had been, he had a laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, about 30 miles south of here. Right. So working on the light bulb brought that project to a point of completion,、mm -hmm. and.、Uh, That was his first major financial success.、Right. So that allowed him to build the West Orange Lab.、Uh, he built that in 1877, and、uh, right at that same time, he was getting back to work on the phonograph.、Right. And、uh, he hired a, a German engineer named Theo Vangemann,、mm -hmm. who was a pianist and、uh, had a background in acoustics.、Right. And、uh, so he signed Theo Vangemann. To work on the phonograph, and Vangemann, since he was a musician, was assigned the job of just experimental music recording. Cool.、Um, the phonograph didn't sound very good in 1887, and so his job was to do test after test after test to try to refine the sound of music on the phonograph. Was the phonograph invented for music or for some other application?、Um, the phonograph was invented in the midst of tests on.、Uh, The tele, trying to improve the telephone, and also at the same time, Edison was working on a recording and reproducing telegraph,、mm -hmm. and so those two ideas combined to become the phonograph. So it was kind of more of a discovery.、Um, uh, it wasn't like a goal that he had in mind. It was something that he happened upon,、sure. and so that's actually why it took quite a while to、uh, to market the machine. It was such a new discovery.、Um, recorded sound was just a brand new idea.、Um, So there was really there were several years of just trying to find a market for the invention.、Mm -hmm. And you're doing an awful lot of technical work. You're busy every second of the recording. What are you doing when you're actually making a recording? Okay, well I have a difficult job today. Uh, uh, we're sort of recreating some of the earliest experiments they did here because one of the things they found out early on was it's difficult to record strings.、Mm -hmm. A string quartet is is not.、Uh, It's not a loud, powerful sound,、right. and you, for acoustical recording, it's it's literally the air pressure that is powering the machine. So they found pretty quickly that strings were difficult.、Um, you could record strings, but、uh, the the sound of the music is almost、uh, is not much higher above just the sound of the surface noise.、Yeah. Um, so that's what we're figuring out today.、Um, And by the turn of the century, they had developed、um, string-like instruments,、uh, actually violins with horns. They、mm -hmm. were called Stroh violin. It was developed in Germany.、Right. Um, and so,、uh, by the turn of the century, they they were using these Stroh violins.、Uh, to your question of of what am I doing、mm -hmm. while the the cylinder is is being recorded,、right. um, you might have you might know the term. It's still in use today. Cut a record. Yes. Um, that's literally what's going on. We're cutting wax shavings from、uh, the cylinder, and the difficulty there is you have these shavings flying off the record. And、uh, so my job, while the record is being cut, is to gently blow the shavings out of the way. I use a little、uh, air bag.、Um, I don't want to press it really hard because that creates noise problems. Right. So I just very, very, very gently kind of brush the. Shavings out of the way. Sure. And you have to do that the full time, start to finish.、Mm -hmm. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes you can do、uh, the best you can, and you still get 
The problem is you get little pieces of the wax stuck under the knife. Yeah. So that's something that I do my best to avoid. Right. Wax is pretty soft. How did Edison go from soft wax, which is only playable a few times, to something that could be marketed and would hang around in people's lives for a while? That was something that they developed over several years. Um, the the uh, brown wax, so I'm using a, a type of record called a brown wax cylinder. Right. And those were used through, through the 1890s. And the difficulty in the 1890s was uh, duplication of mm -hmm. cylinders. It was technically very difficult to mold mm -hmm. and mass produce cylinders. Um, so initially what they do is they use this brown wax, cut the record, and then uh, they would sell the brown wax cylinders. Right. Um, but they didn't last for very long. You, you could get several plays. You could get maybe a hundred plays, a uh, hundred good plays out of a wax cylinder. But each time you play it, it wears a little bit. Mm -hmm. So after a hundred plays, you start to hear the sound deteriorate. Now, brown wax continued to be used for mastering even, in, even up to uh, World War II. Um, but by the turn of the century, they had developed a, a molding process mm -hmm. where they would just cut the master on brown wax right. and then electroplate the wax in metal, create a negative mold, and then they could mold harder, uh, harder materials, yeah. which could stand up uh, to more plays. Which became a model for disc recording with the yeah, master and the mother and there. pressers. Yeah, but, but similarly, uh, like if you were cutting a master disc in 1910, you'd be cutting in brown wax, a similar, mm -hmm. similar material to what was used for the early cylinders. Cool. I noticed back there in the closet, there are a whole room full of different horns. What's the art of choosing the horn for the ensemble or the instrumentalist or the performer? Um, it's a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. uh, because horn, like ma mathematical understanding of horns didn't come about until until the 20s. Mm -hmm. So um, what they were doing in uh, the 1880s, 1890s was, was basically trial and error. They would, they would uh, make a series of different sizes and then just try them. Right. And uh, you can kind of generalize uh, if you're recording a, a, a vocal solo, maybe with piano accompaniment, mm -hmm. you usually see them using a, a smaller horn like the small one I, ha I was using initially. Right. Um, for more bass, you go to the bigger horns, but that quickly gets out of control. Right. Um, they all, and they tried all shapes and sizes. They, the, the largest horn that they tried was 125 feet long. Wow. It actually stretched, stretched between two buildings. You had the phonograph operator in one building and then the horn 125 feet. <sighs> And then on the large end of the horn, you had the musicians. And what, uh, what were the musicians? Was it like a contrabass sarousaphone or something? Um, they tried all different kinds of things. But um, they, for the most part, in general, they, they, they stuck to brass bands because mm -hmm. it's just the right type of uh, sound pressure. Uh, it's, it, they match. You know, it's a horn going into a horn. Right. So it's the right type of property to get a good, strong quality playback. Sure. And while we're in the realm of horniness, the music doesn't just go in a horn, it comes out the horn at home. What's that about? Okay, uh, the two machines, I, I have two machines today. The one is for recording, right. the other is for playback. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're essentially the same. The difference, though, um, is the point that touches the record. On recording, you, you could call it the stylus. The, re the recording stylus is literally a knife. Right. It's a round knife. Um, if you look at one under a microscope, it looks uh, kind of like an ice cream scoop. So when it cuts, it cuts out a round groove. And uh, so that's recording. Um, and on the recording end, the, the musicians are playing into the horn, so the sound pressure is going into the horn mm -hmm. and, and pushing the knife. Mm -hmm. Now for playback, the machine is the same thing except the, the point, the stylus that touches the record. On playback machine, um, Instead of a round knife, it's a polished round ball of the same diameter. So it sits in the groove, and once the record starts turning, it, it rides up and down the groove, and that's what shakes the diaphragm that, that uh, vibrates the air molecules. And then the horn for playback acts like a megaphone, like an acoustic amplifier. Great. Uh, so the air pressure is going the op opposite direction. Understand. So very, almost the same identical machines, it's just uh, a matter of uh, the stylus, what, what type of point is touching the record. Got it. And last question, 
I'm sitting at home, it's 1899, I have a wax cylinder of a recording, I've played it a hundred times, it's gone. Can I shave that off, put it on my home phonograph and have my child sing into the horn and make a recording? Yeah, that was one of the uh, selling points of the cylinder machine, is you could make your own records at home. And you're right, uh, the way that you prepare the record is you, you shave, you shave a, a thin layer, the top layer off the record. Um, and that's actually what I did to prepare for today, is, uh, is I, I have a machine, it's basically a lathe, but it's called a, a, a shaver, a shaving machine. And uh, so I shaved all the cylinders smooth, and the goal is to get, to get the surface as smooth as possible, because any roughness creates noise. Sure. Um, and uh, probably the most difficult thing about getting a good cylinder recording today is uh, maintaining the shaver yes. um, so, so that you can get that really uh, that really smooth surface and uh, like for example it's difficult to the shaver uses a knife a, a straight blade it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a sapphire knife right. um, and that's tough today because they don't make you know you can't buy a new sapphire knife you, you need to have it, it uh, polished right. uh, so that's one of the difficulties is is uh, keep the machi machines maintained with a you know, limit on, on available parts. Good. Well, you are a national treasure. Thank you for doing what you do, and thanks for spending time with us tonight. Okay, thank you.